Well, when we had the meeting about the Charlie Brown Christmas, and I say we only had a day for an outline, he, we, he had certain parameters. He wanted, uh, uh, Schultz did, uh, to, to talk about what he felt was the true meaning of Christmas. He said, I, you know, we think we've lost that. So that we kind of worked backwards from that. We wanted to do the true meaning of Christmas. We wanted, um, I wanted to use different kinds of music. Uh, we knew we'd use traditional Christmas music, and we would use some Beethoven because Schroeder played Beethoven. But when we did the documentary, we had hired a fellow named Vince Garali to do the music on the documentary, and I thought it might be fun to to use some of that music on the Christmas show. And we called Vince, and um, uh, he wrote an opening title song for the show, and I remember I thought maybe we should put some words on it, and I just wrote, scribbled some words down on an envelope. Christmas time is here, happiness, and so forth, and never thought much about it. And so the music became a, a mix of that, and I think the music was critical to, to its acceptance. And um, we thought of different elements about the Christmas tree and so forth and put it all down the outline. And the outline pretty much is the way the show eventually evolved. And um, But I think that the Geraldi music was crucial to its success because that was the first time a cartoon had used jazz, had used adult music. That raised a, a, a certain level, and um, we did the outline in a couple of hours and set it off, and that, that that was it. We never thought that the song would become a Christmas standard. Obviously, that just happened over the years to evolve. Well, I had first called Dave Brubeck, who was an old friend, and he was busy. And he said, "Call Cal Jader, who I went to school with. He was busy, and they referred me to Vince." Years later, they both said, "I <laughs> wish they hadn't been busy." So we met Vince, and he started, and, and he called me one day on the phone and he says I've written this song and you've got to listen to it because I, he didn't write it down that well and he was afraid he was going to forget it and I said oh, I don't want to hear it over the phone and he says don't move and he played Linus and Lucy for the first time and I absolutely it was just something went off in my head that this was going to be very meaningful to us in some way I wasn't quite sure you know which way and that became our, our theme song. And then all the jazz he wrote after that for the Christmas show and everything else, just, you know, he did 17 shows for us. We would show him the storyboards and he'd come up with a theme. And um, he used to drive our animator crazy because he wouldn't finish. He, in jazz, you just kind of, you know, taper off to the end. So we never had any endings. We always had to fade everything out. But uh, yeah, he just, he would look at the storyboards. He'd look at some of the animation, come up with a different theme. He wrote wonderful music. And the albums, the music now... I guess we've sold almost three, th three million albums with the different artists recording the music, uh, his music. So it's been a, quite, a, quite a big deal over the years. How would you describe that musical style that, that was used in the series? Uh, just jazz, straight jazz. I, I don't, I, he never gave me any other um, appellation for it. Just, you know, jazz. And, and uh, you, you, we usually did it with a trio, sometimes with a quartet. And it just seemed to fit the characters. And as I say, it was probably, and Schultz felt the same thing. This was one of the really critical elements to its success. However, when we brought the Charlie Brown Christmas back to CBS, oh, when it was finished, we all thought we had ruined Peanuts. It seemed very slow and it was too religious, blah, blah. We didn't know. And I went back very, with great fear to CBS and I showed it to him. It was a week before it was to go on the air. And they hated it. The two top people just hated it. They said, you know, the, it's too slow and it's very religious. In those days, that was a big deal, you know, back in the 60s. And it's not particularly fun. And I was just devastated, you know, because I, I didn't think it was, it was that good either. And the head guy there said, well, we're going to have to run it. It's scheduled, but unfortunately, you know, there probably aren't going to be any more. And then uh, they, had, they said, there's a guy from Time Magazine downstairs that wants to look at it. And they said, but we don't dare show it to him. It's, we don't like it. I said, well, it's going to be worse if you don't show it to him. So we go down, and there's a fellow in there and me, and we sit and we watch it. And he doesn't say a word, and he gets up and leaves. So I come home absolutely with my tail between my legs, and I figure we are do doomed. Day before the show, Time Magazine comes out, and this fellow wrote the most glowing review you could imagine said it should run forever which shocked all of us then it goes on the air and gets like a 45 share and in those days there were only three networks i think we had half the united states tune in who had television and that monday the cbs fella called up and he said um, 
Well, we're going to buy five, four more Charlie Brown shows, but I wanted you to know that my aunt in New Jersey didn't like it either. That was his, that was his justification. Who, and, who, was, who was that? Oh, I'd, I'd rather not say who they were. I can't, I can't even remember. It's almost 40 years ago. I mean, I wouldn't want to embarrass them. They were two of the three of the top people. And I, I, we happened to agree with them at the time, so. Um, uh, and then we went on to do, well, the show we're going to do this December will be our 50th. Charlie Brown primetime special. 